All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Lee Sauls. How are you doing, Lee? Great, John. How are you? Excellent. And Lee is the founder and CEO of Sales Architects and the author of numerous books, uh, Hire Right, Hire Profits, Business Guide, Business Expert Guide, Small Business. And I love the one that you had before that soared despite your dodo sales manager. That's love. <laughs> but what we're here to talk about today is his book, Sales Differentiation. And um, that book actually has just been awarded by Top Sales World, the silver medal for Top Sales Book 2018. So congratulations on that, Lee. That's fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let's um let's let's dive into into the book. So you have nineteen powerful powerful strategies. So first of all, um, give me a little bit about the the genesis of the book and why you felt you needed to to write you know another sales book. Yeah, sure. So sales differentiation is a philosophy that I've developed over gosh thirty years. Uh, I'll be politically incorrect. The way I describe it is as a teenager is when I first became intrigued by this whole idea of differentiation. So I like to say I got pregnant with the idea as a teenager, but it, the idea wasn't ready to come out and be introduced to the world until now. So it was a very long incubation period. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the philosophy, the strategies uh, associated with sales differentiation are applicable to any industry, any company, any size, B2B, B2C, selling to the government, doesn't matter. See, because... Whatever you're selling, at some point, there's going to be a conversation about price. Mm -hmm. And the more effective you've been at differentiating, the more effective you're going to be at maintaining that price point, protecting margin on what you're selling. So, so, uh, so, um, tell me a little bit. Uh, let's go, let's go a bit deeper into the idea of differentiation because, uh, you know, when most people are are selling and in most organizations, they go, oh, okay, you know, tell tell me what differentiate, you know, let's lay out what differentiates us and our competitive differentiators and all of that. And they tend to be kind of a little rose and stock. So, what do you mean mm -hmm. by differentiation? Yeah, so I break sales differentiation into two components. One is sales differentiation around what you sell. The other is sales differentiation around how you sell. But let's first talk about the what you sell side. So often I find executive teams, salespeople, so passionate about their differentiators. They say, oh, we should never have to have a debate or a discussion on price. There's so much value here. So passionate they are, but completely ineffective in building that passion with someone on the other side of the desk. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of that. I have a, a client here in the state of Minnesota uh, where we have a very, very odd setup, which is most of the counties in Minnesota require the homeowner and business to contract for their own trash removal. Oh. So on Wednesday mornings, I have a parade of garbage trucks coming down my street representing every hauler you could name, seemingly doing the same thing. Truck pulls up to the home, arm extends out, grabs the can, lifts it up empties the contents into the truck, puts it back down, truck drives away, and you get an invoice at the end of the month. Well, a CEO from one of those companies reached out to me and said, Lee, I don't believe we should have to fight over price. I believe we offer meaningful value. I believe there's differences compared to the competition. Now, I was intrigued having witnessed this mm -hmm. week after week, right? Well, he was exactly right. So they went through a program with me. And one of the differentiators we identified is the service they offer called a Can Be Clean, which is twice a year they have this special truck that follows the garbage truck and cleans your garbage cans. Oh, okay. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it and is. They're the, they're the only ones that offer this. Mm -hmm. But their salespeople, the ones that are selling to homeowners, the residential salespeople, didn't know how to have the conversation. So it's wonderful to have a set of differentiators, but if you can't build that passion in someone else, help them to see the vision, you might as well not have it because you're just going to battle over price, which was a struggle they had. So we developed what I referred to as a positioning question. Mm -hmm. It's an open-ended question designed to help someone think differently about the solutions they have or could have. And it aligns with a particular differentiator that you have. So for the residential salespeople, we developed this positioning question, which was to be asked right at the very beginning of the conversation. Right after they introduced themselves, the next thing out of their mouth is, when's the last time you had your garbage cans clean? 
because we know they never have unless they did it themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that, what I mean about the what you sell sales differentiation. Yeah, yeah, and and that's uh, and that's and that's fascinating because I see in 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 one of your um, chapters of the book in in the what you sell is are you are you leaving differentiation open to buyer interpretations? And I think that is a lot a lot of what happens. I mean, you often have to. It's a question you often have to ask a vendor. You sort of halfway through the conversation, you go, "Yeah, but." What makes you different? So how do you how do you get people to understand or to be able to number one identify the differentiation, but two to figure out how to put them up front as opposed to kind of trailing? Well, there's a question that I've asked salespeople. I can't even tell you how many years I've been asking this. And the question is this: Who knows more about the world of potential solutions in your industry? You or the people you sell to? Mm-hmm. John, I've never had a single salesperson say, oh, the people I sell to know sure. much more than I do. Mm-hmm. So we're, as in sales management, we're doing our salespeople a disservice because we keep telling them we've got educated buyers. Yeah. There's this fad called mm-hmm. the internet. Yet we all agree we know more than they do. So even though they have that information, somehow they either aren't understanding it to the same level that we are, they're misunderstanding it, what have you. So that gives us both an obligation and an opportunity. Mm-hmm. I believe if you sign up for a sales career, you have an obligation to help people make an informed buying decision. Correct. That also gives you an opportunity to shape buyer decision criteria. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to buy your stuff. And and another question I love to ask salespeople. So imagine a a large audience and I'll ask, what's the difference? Who can tell me the difference between an organic apple and a regular apple? And there's only a couple of hands that ever go up. (laughs) Yeah, John, one's, this is, one's more this expensive. Is buying every week, John. <laughs> you don't know how to make an educated decision on an apple. You think they know how to buy what you're selling? I know exactly because the only difference most people could say is, "Well, it's more expensive." That's it. <laughs> That's the only thing people can say is, "I know it's more expensive." Therefore, I don't know what the differences are, so I don't mm-hmm. buy it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So it's an interesting that you just touched on there, that idea about, you know, over the last number of years, a lot of people have talked about the educated buyer and it's all the powers in the hands of the buyer. I feel personally, uh, yes, it's a more educated buyer, but it's a more overwhelmed buyer. And I think that is the reason why a, a lot of uh, a lot of times you're losing out to no decisions even in, in a buying cycle because the, the buyer just goes, ah, it's, it's all too much, you know, and I'll just stick with what I have. So um, that's can you talk a little bit more? That's more that's an interesting point, because, as you said, sellers have been told, oh, you know, they're so educated. So you got to be careful that you don't tell them things they already know, but they don't already know most of them. Right. And so we're in agreement that we know more than they do about the world of solutions mm-hmm. in our industry. But if our approach is to come in and lecture, sure, we're going to make for a very short meeting. <laughs> no one likes to be lectured. I've got three teenagers. They don't like to be lectured now. They didn't like it when they were younger. I'm 49. I don't want anybody lecturing me either. Mm. So it's an awful technique. What we need to do is develop questions Questions that help them to see what we see. So that's back to that idea of a, a positioning question. Yeah. Help them see it. That's when, when I work with salespeople, I, I ask them what their goals are for an initial meeting. And I always add one. At some point in the meeting, you want that person the other side of the desk to say, you know what? No one's ever asked me that before. Mm-hmm. That's how you know you're differentiating yourself and building value. But you know, you, you mentioned something interesting there uh, about helping salespeople with this. I find that most salespeople don't even know who their true competitor is. Yeah, I would agree. Well, I'll, with I'll ask them, right? I'll, I'll say, "Who's your biggest competitor?" And they'll rattle off three company names. So I'll say, "Yep, yeah, those are those are good competitors, but there's one even bigger." And someone will say, "Oh, the old sales trainer one, the status quo, mm-hmm. the choice to do nothing." Which is also a formidable competitor. One of the most. There's one bigger, John. You know who that is? Yourself. Nope. Every salesperson calling the same person you are trying to get a meeting. See, we're egocentric. Uh, We think of our little world, right? So, uh, and I'll tell you a little background on me. I was a history major in college. I went to Binghamton University in upstate New York. And one of the things that I learned as a history major is that in the history of business, 
No one has ever had the job description of meet with a salesperson every hour on the hour. <laughs> That's never very good. happened, John. Yeah, very right? good. So we're calling on executives that have this large sphere of influence, and they're getting emails and calls and solicitations from salespeople representing that sphere of influence and beyond. And it's very easy to hit delete in your email, very easy to hit delete in the voicemail. So we've got to be different. Mm -hmm. different right in that first interaction see it's the battle for facetime and i don't mean the apple technology yeah, yeah. we've got to be different so that we are the ones that get that meeting because if there's no meeting there's no proposal if there's no proposal there's no sale no commission check yeah i think no i think that's a that's a fantastic point because um as you say i mean in in sales you tend to be egocentric and you tend to think you know well if i send you a compelling message right now or leave a compelling message or even get you on the phone and you're operating on my time. Well, you know, you're not operating on my time. You're operating on your time. And I think that's also why a lot of salespeople give up too easily because they don't realize that um, timing is everything as well. You know, you have to have a compelling message, but it also has to come at, at the right time. Right? It does. And, and so I don't want to just say you need to have a compelling message or a compelling approach. I'm going to share a strategy. It's actually presented in the book, but I'll share it with uh, our, our audience today. Imagine it's two in the morning and there's a pounding on your front door. It's the police. Mm -hmm. They want to have a conversation with you about a crime that's recently been committed. John, what'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> Now, they don't randomly pick your home and you for a conversation. Exactly. They follow a trail of evidence, put together a crime theory, and that has led them to you for a conversation right now. Can you see where we're going? Oh, yeah, completely. A sales crime theory, which is based on the answer to this question. Why should they want to have a conversation with you right now? Not why should we talk with them. Why should they want to talk with us right now yeah because they have done their research and they know that um, you're the person that they need to talk to right now right so we need to do research for that answer mm -hmm. and so we pick up the phone and call someone we've done some research that screams to us they should want to have a conversation right now mm -hmm. see we tell salespeople you got to do pre-call research you got to do research but we don't give any context on how to use the information yeah so this whole idea of a sales crime theory takes this idea of saying, okay, let's look at what we sell and what are the triggers that would say, boy, they should want to have a conversation with us right now. I'll give you an example. What if you sell technology systems for conference rooms? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you hear that a company is relocating or expanding or moving to, you know, expanding an office or what have you. That tells you that the conference room is going to be affected in some yeah. way. Mm -hmm. So, they should want to have a conversation with you right now to help them figure out the right technological solution for that conference room. Right, correct. So it's um, so yeah, so uh, and I think you um, you touched upon something really important there about the context of of research and and because yes, people are told to do pre call planning, but not the context of it. And there, what you've been outlining there is. There are these are key indicators that there is, as you say, your crime scene. Key indicators that's pointing you to this is a good suspect, right? Mm -hmm. Why should they want to have a conversation with you right now? Right. Um. So, um, another part of um, when you're in a situation, you have it. You know, shaping buying a buyer decision criteria, and this is always a this is always one that's very that's difficult for a lot of salespeople because they assume that the buyer already has their criteria, and they also assume that when a buyer says, "This is my top." priority or this is my top <clears throat> criteria that that is really their top criteria so talk to me a little bit about shaping and educating a buyer during that process sure so oftentimes we'll run into that they'll say this is my criteria but we accept this foundation that we know more than they do about our industry so mm -hmm. we have to guide them and ask them questions about aspects that they may not have thought of very common when uh, requests for proposals rfps come up you get all these questions and you read and go, well, what about this, that, and the other? Mm -hmm. And we're afraid to go back to that company and ask them what their plan is. Right. So, 
even a formal buying process, you can go back to the procurement agent and say, thank you for including us in, the, in this process. Here are some questions that we have uh, as we evaluate whether or not to respond. See, there's no law that says you have to respond to every RFP. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Right? So you the less interested they are in providing you information relative to those questions, the less interested you should be in going after that opportunity. Yeah, and, and that's a great point that you uh, that you raise here about creating, as you talked about, about creating value and differentiation, right? Is you should be creating value through... Uh, asking them questions about things that they may not have thought about or they may not have thought enough about. Uh, you know, it's one of the value drivers is, you know, the unforeseen um, solution or opportunity or whatever. Uh, but that's a... I'll that's give you, a, I can give you an example. Mm -hmm. Let me bring us to life for, for the yeah. group. <clears throat> so I finally got with the program and decided to replace the recess lighting in my home with LED bulbs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And those were supposed to last some teen years and very efficient, reduces costs, all that good stuff. Well, the bulb in my daughter's bathroom and her shower kept burning out. And I had the electrician come in because that's obviously not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And he puts his hand up there and goes, oh, Lee, it's all wet up here. And he looks up in my attic. And he says, you have no insulation by your hi-hats. Now, I'm not technical. I just figured out that hi-hat meant the recess lighting. Mm -hmm. So you got to get some insulation blowing up here. And so here's the extent of my knowledge of insulation. I know it's pink yeah. and it's R something or other. That's the extent of it, John. So I go into Google, find three companies to come out and give me a bid for the project. First company I call, they make the appointment, they come out, give me a price. Second company makes the appointment, they come out, give me a price. The third company, have a conversation with them, schedule the appointment, then I receive an email. I'm guessing you've never purchased insulation before. Here are a series of questions you want to ask so that you make an informed buying decision. Thank you. Because yeah. I didn't even know what to ask these people. No, Is it no. pink? Is yeah. it or something or other? Yeah, and, and that's all I know. It's pink, it's or something, and you shouldn't eat it. And you shouldn't <laughs> eat it. That's exactly right. Then he comes out, and he takes a look, and, and he's – Ask me a question. So, so are you planning to take advantage of the rebate from the utility company for having insulation blown? I said, what are you talking about? He says, didn't you say you already met with two of my competitors? I said, mm -hmm. yeah. And they didn't tell you that there was a $500 rebate? Mm -hmm. None of them. He was the highest price. He got the job. Yep. And I'd have been right there with you. Right. But here's the kicker. Was his insulation any better than the other ones? No, it, it was, was pink. It was pink, yeah, exactly. And it was our something or other. That's <laughs> all I know. Good. But you know, back to what we said before about the two components of sales differentiation, what you sell and how you sell. How you sell is a tremendous opportunity to help you win deals at the prices you want. And that's what he did. He didn't try to tell me that his insulation was any better. He didn't try to argue that his product was the right product and his competitors had junk. Mm -hmm. The way that he sold it, he demonstrated expertise, demonstrated care, and helped me make an informed buying decision. Yeah, I, I, a number of years ago, you know, I was fortunate to do some work with, with Neil Rackham, who wrote uh, Spin Selling, cause I, and he used to always say that the way you know you did a really good sales call was if you could if you uh, asked the buyer would they write you a check for the sales call not for the product for the sales call right so there if he'd have said to you uh would you give me 15 dollars for this piece of advice you probably would have said yeah that's worth it right. to me yeah yeah absolutely well uh, especially when he told me about the 500 dollars that i was yeah. missing out on the other guys exactly exactly um so and um, just talk a bit a little bit about the irrefutable differentiator before we run out of time Okay, sure. So we could get into arguments and debates around differentiators, around what you sell and how you sell. But there's one. There is one differentiator you can't argue with me about, and that is you. Mm -hmm. See, because you're part of the package. When I decide to buy from you, you're part of the deal. Yep. So in addition to the product or service, technology, whatever it might be, I'm buying from you, and therefore there needs to be identified value. I call it personal value differentiation. Every salesperson, whether you're new to sales or you're a veteran 30, 40 years at it, you have personal value differentiation that 
can be positioned with someone that leads them to want to do business with you rather than your competitor. And I find salespeople don't take a step back and think about what is my personal value differentiation? And they need to figure out what that is and then position it as part of the sale to differentiate themselves. Yeah, and, and I, I love that, um, Lee, because I do think that uh, that salespeople don't spend enough time looking at themselves and the value that they can bring to the team. And working on it, investing in themselves. That's the other Absolutely. part, is invest is don't wait around for people to train you or to give you additional skills. You should be investing in yourself. You know, Maybe spend a little less time practicing your golf swing because, let's <laughs> face it, if you're not a pro by now, that's probably not going to put food on your table. Maybe invest a little Very more true. time on investing in the thing that does put food on your table. That's right. Well, listen, Lee, this has been fantastic. Uh, the book, uh, highly recommend sales differentiation. Uh, and if you even just go on Amazon and look at the uh, testimonials you hear, you have a who's who of, uh, of people from the sales uh, performance and improvement industry. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is obviously a highly rated book. Yeah, great. So I would really recommend it. I recommend it to everything because as we know nowadays, differentiation is getting harder and harder. So it's really so where you should spend some time. And just before we go, uh, Lee, how can people find out more about you? Very simply, they can go to salesdifferentiation.com. As a matter of fact, uh, if you do buy the book Sales Differentiation, it's available in the brick and mortar stores and your favorite website, Amazon, what have you. Uh, it's available in hardcover, Kindle, and audiobook. Mm. Regardless of where you buy it, when you go to salesdifferentiation.com, you're going to see a little flag that says bonus. I have a video series that normally is only available to my workshop clients that I'm making available to those who purchase the book. All you got to do is click on that bonus, fill out the form, and you'll start getting a video a week. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, that's another great, uh, great added value, another differentiator. There you go. <laughs> All right. Listen, uh, Lee Sauls, thank you very much. This has been great. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.